So let me just check and make sure. I, so am I on? Okay, awesome. Because that was why I ran to the back of the, <laughs> of the church. I could not quite, wasn't sure that I was actually on. And so now we're being recorded because, you know, I'm as obsessed with myself as you are with yourselves. <laughs> there must be a recording. Um, so I wanted to, um, one, just say how wonderful it is to be back in the space again and be back with you. I also wanted to just take a moment because it seems that there is a, a space for a moment of concentrated thought around those of us who are walking with familiars, walking with two-legged animal, two, two animals of the air, of the ground, that that connection is very present for me for some reason, for a number of things that are going on. I'm someone who is 51 years old and has never had a pet. But that relationship is so holy and so delicious, I almost feel now that I've missed something and I'm actually learning to be with. So it's got to be difficult to understand how to be without in that moment of transition. So I just want us to be mindful and prayerful that we're not just talking about beings that are owned, but we're talking about souls that walk with us and companion us and often, even without language, know us better than people know us. So let us just be mindful of the presence and the importance of familiars in our community. Amen? Amen. All right. So um, I also want to thank Elizabeth um, for hosting me last night and for her hospitality. We had the best time. Almost didn't make it here because we kept talking this morning. Um, <laughs> but we did make it here on time, so don't be mad at her. Um, I think in terms of this idea of the myth of freedom, which is what I want to speak about today. And interestingly enough, I've spoken about before here, because I've actually spoken here in July, and freedom was the theme. So again, I tried not to look at, and I did not look at the notes from the old sermon just to see, because they're not going to remember, and figure out, oh, I'll just brush it off. I'll just change a couple of words, and I'll do that same one. Fortunately, I've not been in ministry that long that I've got like such a repertoire. Um, but it occurred to me, and, and I've actually spoken this month at Unity of New York on freedom. So I tried not to steal from that, and that was harder because that was just two, week, two, two weeks ago. But there's an overall learning that I want to just start with, which is when a person experiences freedom from and we're gonna distinguish that freedom from some condition or situation, the soul then heals a little bit more. The soul actually is able to understand itself in relationship to all of divinity in a way that while enslaved or while caught up with that thing, we're just not able to. The other thing is that when that happens, when you have that moment of escape, if you will, or freedom from some situation, we actually have an experience of ourselves authentically as divine. We literally can access and feel in our personality, in our humanity, that there is something greater than us operating in our favor. That's where we ultimately want to end up. But there are still some myths associated with this idea of freedom that we find ourselves operating in that are the, the wall, if you will, the obstacle, whatever vision works for you, what image works for you, that there is something that gets in the way of that authentic experience of the divine. So the first one, and the first myth that I want to talk about is that we actually want to be free. It's a little bit of a myth. Because really, 
as spiritual people committed to our own development, committed to the development of the planet, committed to all human beings experiencing themselves as whole and complete and all of that. Really, isn't it just easier on a daily basis to be righteous and judgmental and self-serving and angry and underwhelmed and generally dissatisfied with yourself? and even underwhelmed and generally dissatisfied with the people around you and the world. Kind of like you wake up in the morning and say, I married this. <laughs> this is what my life is. Because it really would be easier, and it is easier, to just kind of languish in our own self-directed, drama of our lives. And it generally is just easier to do that. But the sad news for all of you is that that's really not what you're committed to, which causes the, con the, uh, the struggle, for lack of a better word, that you're really more interested in being this spiritually enlightened being of power and service and general jelly bean goodness. That's really what we want to be. But there is this struggle between what we say we want and how we daily operate, where we put our intention and our focus. And Gary Zukoff in The Seat of the Soul talks about the four dynamics of freedom. That there are four dynamics of freedom that we need to explore in order to understand ourselves to be authentically connected to the divine, an authentic expression of the soul. One of those is humbleness. So just think in your own life the struggle that you might have around humbleness. Do you see the beauty of each soul on the earth and every living creature as your equal? or not. Forgiveness is the second of these dynamics. Do you hold yourself accountable for your experience of life? Regardless of what anybody else or any organization, any government, any legal structure, the people in your life, do you hold yourself fully accountable for your experience of life? Or is it somebody else's fault that you have the life that you do or that you experience life as you do? Do you live your life not judging anyone, including yourself? That's a big one. But that would be living a life completely present to forgiveness. Do you live, is clarity, clarity, another one of these dynamics. Do you see the world and yourself through wisdom, through knowledge applied, is one definition of wisdom. Knowledge applied to life. Do you see yourself through that? And do you experience your fellow human beings with compassion? And not pity. Compassion is distinct from pity. Compassion. It's a compound word. With passion. Do you engage people with the passion that you have around being a spiritual person or are they just another obstacle between you and what you got to get done that day? The fourth of these dynamics is love. Do you live in love? Is your daily experience one in which you live inside the greatest lesson of them all? 
that your breath, your language, your walk, your talk, your interactions with everyone and everything is inside of love. Or is your domination of things and people around you your preferred source of interaction? So that becomes the question. And rather than being focused on, I want to be free from my finances, I want to be free from this relationship, maybe the focus is on being free from the status quo of spiritual living. Maybe there's an opportunity to really say that it's not so much that you want to be free from circumstances, you want to be free from your experience and your reaction and your limited ability to be all that God can have you to be in the face of your circumstances. Maybe that's what there is to really be free from. So that's the first myth. <laughs> the second myth, which I think I've said here before, is that freedom is free. And we really kind of have it through a lot of social constructions, that freedom is free. And in Christianity, kind of how it shows up in some expressions is that, well, Jesus paid it all. Yes, an example of what we would have to do in order to experience that same level of love for, <coughs> excuse me, love for humanity was an example it wasn't the last thing that was ever going to be done in the name of God. So um, Joseph has always kidded me because last November I went to Hong Kong and I started talking about this experience that I had in Hong Kong and then somehow just got distracted in the middle of my sermon. He's kind of like, you left me there walking in the middle of Hong Kong and I never knew what happened. <laughs> So I'm going back to that. <laughs> I finally found the moment where it fits. And inside of this idea that freedom is free, so we're walking, a colleague of mine and I are walking down the waterfront in Hong Kong, just looking at all of the, the, the scenery and the vistas and taking pictures, and we literally walked the entire length from where we got off the train. And we get to kind of the end and look to our right, and we see some tents. And I said to her, I said, do you think that's the Occupy movement? And she said, it might be. And in my first look at it, it was kind of not a big deal. I mean, like I could count the number of tents and this doesn't really seem to be a showing of people that anyone should be concerned about, never mind dispatch the police or anything. So we start walking in the direction of these tents and then as you get to one set, we turn to our left and then you see more. And it's this walkway that kind of goes down to where the tents are. And there are all of these messages that people have posted onto the walls. All of these messages basically asking for or stating why they are there. Why people are there. So we walked into this larger area and then, so there's this larger area of tents and then we look to our right and then there's an even more expansive area. So basically what's happening is from the water back to the highway, you just continue to walk through more and more tents of people who have left their jobs, left their families, left their daily activities to actually sit and stand for freedom. For an expression of freedom that they believe is not yet present. Now, that doesn't make their sacrifice better than yours or more than yours, but freedom is not free. Freedom requires some kind of action 
and often some kind of sacrifice. And we have to be willing to snap ourselves out of our own narrative long enough to be able to say and think about what am I willing to surrender to be free from fill in the blank? Because we got to pay with something. So I'm walking, we're walking, and then we get to this promenade almost. And so it's interesting because you're walking through this area that would, under normal circumstances, be something else. It would be a highway, or it would be the beginning uh, or the entrance to a, a campus or to a school. All of that is what it would normally be, but now it becomes this background for all of these messages about freedom. One was, and this was like up on an overpass, so literally, it's a, regularly it's a street, it's a highway, and across this overpass was this banner that says, um, my parents are crying for me. I am crying for the future. Another one said, I love Hong Kong. I will not give up. And the thing that actually made me begin to cry was thinking about all of these actions that these activists are taking. Will we really ever be able to connect the subtle changes in society and even laws that might be changed directly to their activism. Because so often, activists and their stories get lost when change happens. And that is their sacrifice, that they don't have to be known as the one who made it happen. That is their willing sacrifice that life would be different for generations to come. When we think about the examples that we already have in spirituality that we can access, we have the Christ who was fully human and fully divine as an example of how and what we could accomplish. In Islam, the root word of Islam is salam, peace. The peace that comes when one's life is surrendered to God. That is what the word Islam means. The example of the Buddha, who embraced and became everything, and rather than just transfigure and disappear from existence, turned back and stepped away from the all to show people, here is a way that I've discovered to the all. Don't follow me, follow this path. We have examples of what it takes to be free. But then the question becomes, and I only have a couple of minutes, is, and this is the third myth, is that freedom is power. And the question becomes, what kind of power are we talking about? Gary Zukoff talks about authentic power. And authentic power means that you are a being that loves life in all its forms. Do not judge who or what you encounter and see value in the smallest possible things on the earth. That is an, that's authentic power that's living in authentic power. So when you think about the things that you say you want to be free from, does it give you access to that? 
or does it give you more power to dominate the people or the institutions who you think are responsible for your freedom or for your lack of it? Because when we look at what is your freedom for, freedom is so that others can be made free. Your freedom from anything is not just about you. It is for the universe. Because when your soul activates and understands fully itself to be connected to all that is, empowered to be able to accomplish all that is, and you're walking around Main Street in Sag Harbor like that, that provides something else for people. When you show up on your job, not dominating people, but actually feeding people power in ways they can't understand, that is different. That's worth the sacrifice. That's worth not being given the, you know, the keys to the kingdom because you did something. But then your freedom becomes for something and for people. I want to leave you with a quote. This was written by Frederick Douglass. And it was part of a speech that he gave on West India emancipation in, I think, 1846. Oh, I'm looking at it, it says 1857. <laughs> it's on the paper. He says, let me give you a word of the philosophy of reforms. The whole history of the progress of human liberty shows that all concessions yet made to her august claims have been born of earnest, struggle. The conflict has been exciting, agitating, all-absorbing, and for the time being, putting all other tumults to silence. It must do this, or it does nothing. If there is no struggle, there is no progress. Those who profess to favor freedom and yet depreciate agitation are men and women who want crops without plowing up the ground. They want rain without thunder and lightning. They want the ocean without the awful roar of its many waters. This struggle may be a moral one, or it may be a physical one, or it may be both moral and physical, but it must be a struggle. Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did, and it never will. Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did, and it never will. When we think about marriage equality, that was a power given to some that was demanded a second look. When we think about the right for women in the United States to vote and not given to them until 1920, not even a hundred years ago, that that power structure required a demand that said women are equal in thought and leadership to men and deserve the right to vote. Any structure, any system of 
inauthentic power or external power that is not working in the behest of all eventually will be presented with a demand by someone. The question then becomes, what can you free yourself from so that you can either make that demand or see to it that a demand is made for freedom, for equality, and for justice for all people? I thank you, and let us all thank God. <laughs>